Welcome to the second of three um, in a series called Bridges to Multicultural Collaboration. Um, Donna Gaspar Jarvis uh, down in the back is uh, the architect of this wonderful series that this is round two this year. And um, the Channels program has been um, fortunate to sponsor um, a patient-centered medical home series. Um, the first one had to do with what is a patient-centered medical home, and our colleagues from Portland Community Health Center were here to, um, to work with us on that. Tonight, we are fortunate to have a faculty member from the Department of Nursing, Professor Deb Kramlick, who is actually going to be sharing with us training on what to do when your child gets sick. It's an institute for health advancement um, program that she was trained in several years ago. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Deb. Great, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Thank you for all coming this evening. Um, a few housekeeping tidbits to uh, take care of. If you can all turn your cell phones off or at least silence them, that would be great. Um, if you can't and have to take a phone call, just um, go to the back and take care of it. Um, on each of your tables, you're going to find some handouts. One is a, uh, a photo release. This is being videotaped tonight. Um, there are a number of folks who could not make it, and we wanted to make this training available to uh, as many people as possible. So if you could complete the, the, the photo release, that would be great. And there are a few other handouts to help us throughout the presentation. This is a program that was developed through UCLA and Johnson & Johnson way back in the early 2000s. Um, those folks um, at Johnson & Johnson and um, UCLA noticed parents um, really didn't have the resources that they needed to help take care of their kids at home. They were using the emergency department very frequently when they weren't sure what to do when their kids were, were sick. Um, you know, back in the day, we all had our, our mothers and our grandmothers that gave us great advice on how to take care of our kids, and we just don't have it to that degree anymore. And so parents were unsure, you know, is my, is my child really sick? Do I need to go to the doctors? Maybe I need to go to the emergency department. I really don't know what to do. And the majority of parents didn't even have a, a simple book to use to look at to see if this was anything serious that they were seeing in their child. So this program was developed as a way to empower parents to take better care of their kids, to know when their ch children were very ill, when they needed to see the physician, or when it, when it was something they could take care of at home. And what they found was that inappropriate use of the emergency department decreased dramatically. <coughs> inappropriate calls to the physician decreased dramatically, and parents were able to take care of their children at home when it was appropriate. So the purpose of this evening is to help you become acquainted with this book so that you can go out and um, empower those families that you work with on use of, of this book. The objectives for this evening um, are for you to be able to use the book, to empower those parents, to help protect them from accidents and um, injuries, to help them care for their sick children, to know when they should call the doctor or the nurse, when it is appropriate. We don't ever want families to feel like they can't call a doctor or a nurse when they should when they have those questions, but it will help them to know better, you know, should I be calling the doctor or a nurse about this, or is it something I can take care of at home? Um, to know when it's an emergency, and they really should get help there immediately. To know how to take their children's temperatures. You know, as, as healthcare providers, we assume that families know how to take their children's temperatures and what a fever is. We just make those assumptions and we find out many times these families don't even have thermometers. 
Um, if they do have thermometers, they don't know how to take their children's temperatures, how to read the thermometer, what is a fever. So we'll work on that this evening so that you can work with those families on that skill. And then um, the appropriate measurement of liquid medication. Again, we find that families aren't really sure how much medication to give, how to measure it. They use kitchen spoons instead of the appropriate measurement devices, so we're going to work on that skill as well. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, we'll work with the books and then take a little break, and then I'll hand out the, uh, the show and tell and, and we'll play at the tables on working on some of these skills. So, how does that sound? Is this what you all signed up for? Okay. So I think I gave you a, a, a brief overview. I don't think you need to know any more about where this program came from. Um, we'll really work more on how to use the book. I think that's the most important piece of it, is, is how valuable the book is and, and how it can be used with families. And then a little bit on taking care of sick children at home and how to prevent those accidents. So when this program was first developed, um, the outcomes were really based on parents' surveys. They asked before the training, um, what do you do when your children have a cough, when they have a cold, when they have a fever, when you think they have an ear infection, what is your first resource? And before the training, the parents, as I said, were using the emergency department or taking them to the doctors and not using a, a primary resource that might help them take care of their children at home. Um, after the training, they were more apt to use the book as a resource to, to help them make that decision. And they were using the emergency department much less frequently. So they were noticing um, much better outcomes after the training. The other dramatic decrease was that parents were missing less work and children were missing less school. That's another important component of it. Prior to the training, the parents were often keeping their children at home when they didn't need to. They weren't sure, should my child go to school? Should my child go to daycare? and they were keeping them at home, and that meant parents were missing um, valuable time at work as well, and for many of those parents, if they didn't go to work, they weren't getting paid either, and at times risking their jobs. So after this parent training, they found that parents were missing much less work, and the kids were missing much less school. So very valuable output. This training is, um, is occurring in all 50 states at this point, primarily through the Head Start programs. So it's been a, a, a valuable resource. So just to, to recap, how can this training help parents? The children may miss fewer days at school. The children will be better prepared for school. The parents can, can help keep them well at home, keep them safe, and the, parent, the, the children can attend school safely. Parents may miss fewer days of work. Parents aren't sitting in an emergency room. As you all know, you go to the emergency room, you get triaged. The sickest people get seen first. And many times these parents are sitting for hours and hours in an emergency room with their children, exposed to people who are much sicker than they are, risking increased illness for them, and worrying, you know, is my, is my child going to be okay? What are they going to tell me? So they're, they're spending much less time inappropriately in the emergency department. And ultimately it saves time and money for the parents. <laughs> So what will be different after you've worked with these families? Hopefully the families will be much less panicked when their children are sick. They'll, they'll, they'll know better how to tell if their children are really ill and if they should have them seen by a physician or, or in the emergency department. 
They'll know when to call the physician or when to call the nurse or when to call 911. And they'll just feel more confident about taking care of their children at home. So you all have copies of the book. Does anybody not have a copy of, of the book? Do you all have one? OK. So what's, what's great about this book? First of all, it's large print. Very, very simple language. So the parents should be able to, uh, to, to understand the words. Often parents don't feel comfortable admitting that they don't know. They might have a book that they've gotten at the library or that somebody loaned them, and they don't understand the language. Or they go to the doctors, and physicians might use language that they're not accustomed to. They use big words, and the parents don't feel comfortable saying, I don't understand what you're telling me. And so they leave a visit having no idea what they were just told and what they're supposed to do with their children. So these books are in, in very simple language. And it uses lots of pictures, which really helps. So a couple of features of this book. First of all, the pictures. If you look on page, well, VI and VII, the Roman numerals. There's a picture of a baby on one side and a picture of a child on the other. And it has some of the common illnesses and injuries, symptoms that parents might see. And this is one way that they can look up, gee, my child has something wrong with their ear. I wonder where I can find ear problems. And it gives the pages. So that's one way that parents can find information. There's a table of contents. So if you look on the next page. So they can also look up the information using the table of contents. In the back of the book, it has an index that they can look up the information. So a number of ways that they can find the information that they're looking for on their children. There's also a word list. So if the parents see something in writing that they're not sure, what does this word mean? I don't understand. Then there's also the word list in there that they can, they can look up information. So lots of different ways that, that families can, can find the information that they need. The other great feature about this book, when you take these to the families, we encourage you to sit down with the families. In the front cover, you'll see a place where they can put emergency numbers. They can write their doctor's name and phone number. They can write poison control number in there. Their health insurance. This is something that they could take to, to physician visits or to the emergency department with them because they can have all the information in one place. So we encourage you to sit down with the families, help them fill out that information as, as best as they can. So they make this book theirs. They have some ownership of it. They know that this is where they can have one-stop shopping for all the information that they need. In addition, there's a place where they can write notes so that when you're working with them, they can, they can jot down little, little tidbits of information to help them as well. You know how it is when you get training the first time, you miss a lot of things. You're not sure, it's like, oh, what did they tell me? I don't remember. This is where they can write it down, have a chance to go back and review it later and say, oh, OK, now I remember what we talked about. So, Families really can personalize these books. 
The other nice thing about the books is that every single chapter has the same five sections. So the parents know where to find um, each piece of information. What is it? So whatever the, the, the illness is or the injury is, it says right from the beginning what it is. What do I see? So the parents look and say, gee, what does this look like to me? Is my child showing these symptoms? Is this what it looks like? What can I do at home? So it lets the parents know that there are things that they can perhaps do at home before they call a physician or go to the emergency department. Or it may tell them, you need to call for help right away when they should call the doctor or the nurse. And any other information they should know about the particular illness or injury that they, that they may be seeing. So just to review before we go forward and start playing with the book, can anybody tell me some of the uh, features in this book that makes it different. What have we talked about so far that makes this book different than maybe some other resources? Don't make me call on you. Yes. Personalize. Yes, you can you can personalize it. Absolutely. What else? Yes. It has pictures in it. What else? It doesn't require a battery. Yeah, that's rare in these days, right? It doesn't require a battery. Yes? It's easy to navigate. Absolutely. Very easy to navigate. Yes? Really, really common conditions, not really rare things. Right. It's, it's common everyday conditions that, that parents may see in their children. Plain language that's understandable. Very plain language that should be understandable. What else? A few more features of this book that, that make it very valuable and, and much different from other resources. Besides the plain language, what else? Yes. Yes, she said each condition has the same five topics, so you know what to look for. What else? Yes. What's that? Can, can understand very well. Okay. Okay, so both children children who have reading skills already could read this and understand it as well as the parents. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It may not seem like a big deal, but I think the fact that there are multicultural pictures mm. make it feel like it was developed for everybody. Abs that's a that's a good point. There are multicultural pictures in here, so it feels inclusive. Anything else that we may have missed? Yes. Yes, large font, easy to read. Anything else that we've missed? Let's see if we got them all. Large print, large print, there's the first one. Easy to understand language, lots of pictures makes it much easier so a parent can look and say, yes, that is exactly what my child looks like. It has the table of contents that they can find information, it has an index that they can find the information, it has a word list to help them with that vocabulary, and each chapter has the same five sections. So you got all of those and a few extras that they didn't mention, so good job. So now it's time to do a little, little show and tell here. So everybody get your books out. And who can find earache just using the pictures in the front of the book? I should have brought prizes for the first person to find the, the answer. So what page did you find earache on just using the pictures? 
46, page 46, did you all find that? So page 46, it says plain language earache. You notice it also uses the medical term for earache in case a healthcare practitioner tells a parent that your child has otitis media. The parents can see, oh, that's what that means. My child has an earache. So they understand that. And you all see it has the same five sections. So it tells them what causes an earache. What is it? What is otitis media? What do I see? Is my child displaying any of these symptoms? Are they crying? Are they rubbing their ear? Are they pulling on their ear? Is there anything coming out of their ear? What can I do at home? You know, do I have to go to the doctors or are there some things that I can do at home to take care of my child? When should I call the doctor if they have an earache? So it gives them all of that information that they, they might need to help take care of their child if they has an ear, have an earache. Okay, good job. So let's find sore throat using the table of contents. Sixty-three, did you all find it? And you see the same five sections again. This is the ever popular head lice, okay? We get questions about that all the time. So find head lice using the index in the back of the book. One twenty one. Did you all find that? So many different ways that families can find the information that they need when they're wondering about what do I do with my child. So caring for a sick child, what can the book help families do? And I, I say you, but you are the ones who are going to be going out and helping the families with this. So we're going to talk a little bit about some common health myths that families might have. And, and these may sound familiar to all of you. Signs that a child may be sick. How to check a child's temperature. We, we talked about that. What to do at home for a sick child. When to call the doctor or nurse. And we'll talk a little bit about over-the-counter medications because that's a big question for parents as well. So does anybody want to offer some of the common health myths that you've heard? Anybody want to start with one? What are some of those health myths out there that you may have heard growing up or heard other people say? Go ahead. Oh, that you have to wait an hour to eat before you go swimming. Why do you think our mothers told us that we had to wait an hour to eat before we went swimming? What's that? She needed an hour to clean up. That's right. Mom <laughs> needed an hour to clean up and rest after feeding us. So, um, yes. What's another health myth that you may have heard? Yes. Vaccines can cause, um, is it Down syndrome or what is it? Autism. autism. Autism, that vaccines can cause autism. What are some other very common, you know, illness health myths? We're in the middle of winter. What do you hear about winter time? Yes, you'll catch cold if you go outside without what? Without jacket or without a hat? 
if you go out without your hat? And what else in particular, if you go out without your hat and if your hair is wet? If you go outside in the cold with wet hair, you're going to get a cold. Anybody hear that? Yeah. What are some other health myths you might have heard? Any others that you can think of? Yes. What's that? Immediately after eating. Immediately. Don't, go Don't go to bed immediately after eating. Okay. Anybody heard that one? Yeah. So let's see. Anybody heard feed a cold, starve a fever? Some people might say feed a fever, starve a cold. I don't know. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. A runny nose means that they have a cold, allergies, or a sinus infection. That having a runny nose is always a bad thing, means you're sick. That's another myth. Doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're sick. That if you're coughing, it means you have a cold coming. Doesn't always mean that. Anybody ever heard that a fever is good for you? Let them burn off those bugs. Yeah. Yep, that's a myth too. If you go outside with wet hair, you'll catch a cold. Eating carrots will make your eyesight better. <laughs> so there are a lot of health myths that, that get perpetuated they, that may get in the way of, of families being able to take good care of their kids. So how would parents know if their children were sick? I included a handout at your table. I, I forgot to mention, I'm also a, a child care health consultant for a number of area child care providers. And all daycare centers need to have exclusion criteria. You know, when, when can co kids come to school? When can they? not come to school, when should they stay home, when are we going to call parents to come pick them up. And this is a sample exclusion policy that I share with my daycare providers to help them to write their policies. And this information comes directly from the American Academy of Pediatrics as well as um, the Caring for Our Children um, initiative. So these are all evidence-based um, exclusion criteria. Just to give you an idea when you're working with families, what constitutes an illness that the child needs to stay home. Sometimes families are keeping children home unnecessarily. So for instance, what, what is a fever? You know, families don't always know what the cutoff is for a fever versus not. So this gives them an idea of when a child has a fever. Sometimes children have loose bowels because they've changed their diet, not because they're sick. Vomiting is never a good thing. Nobody wants a kid going to school when they're vomiting. Um, but, you know, a fever in and of itself is not necessarily criteria for keeping a child home. If they're not acting sick, there is nothing else except a, a low-grade fever. That's not something that a, a child needs to stay home for. So helping to parents to kind of decipher that. Um, and this book will help as well with that. So we, we tell parents that a fever accompanied by other symptoms, they're not acting like themselves. They can't comfortably um, participate in the activities at school. Um, if they have a rash with the fever, if they have diarrhea and a fever. So f usually fever accompanied by some other symptom. Um, if they have a run-of-the-mill runny nose, that's no reason to keep them home. And we often hear parents say, well, or I hear my daycare providers at times say, well, it's green, so it means they're sick. It means they've got um, a bacterial infection and they should stay home. 
doesn't necessarily mean that. So um, it's the runny nose accompanied by other symptoms. A cough, again, it depends. You, you all know, you get into the middle of winter, everybody's coughing. Is that a reason to stay home? No. People go to the grocery store when they're coughing, they go out in public, all, all kinds of places when they're coughing. You're gonna catch it as easily at a public place as you are going to school or, or daycare, so. Diarrhea, if it's not due to uh, a change in diet habits, if it's accompanied by um, abdominal pain, if it's accompanied by fever, if it has any, any blood or, or pus in it, if, it, if it looks very different. If they're vomiting, we tell parents, if your child is throwing up, they need to stay home. They don't feel good. Saying that if your child is tired, that's a little vague. We say if children aren't acting like themselves, if they have a fever, they're just not feeling like, like being active when they're, when they're up and about. Um, kids usually want to play. They want to be up with their friends. So if they don't feel like being up and around with their friends, there may be something going on and, and you might want to investigate. They, they should probably stay home. So before we get into uh, playing with all the show and tell stuff. I want you all to take a little bit of time at your tables to, to go through these books, see what kinds of illnesses um, the, the book talks about. Maybe take about five minutes to, to take a look through, to talk with your table mates, See if it brings up any questions. If you see any information in there that is, is new to you, is a surprise to you. And while you're looking through the book, Morgan, would you want to come help me pass out the show and tell? it again. Does anybody have any questions about the book at this point? Okay. Just like a question yes. about, um, I don't know, but maybe there's something lacking actually in the book uh, concerning um, uh, some information about milestone, for example, like if it's a mother's day complaining that my, my child is not, for example, is now seven months, is not sitting. Right, so it's, there is no any indications of, for example, like some key delayed signs of. Uh, okay. Unless, uh, yeah, so maybe this is an observation. So developmental, developmental milestones. Yeah, milestones. It's not there, despite it's easy to catch, especially with uh, some others, because, for example, like some of them maybe like uh, the, the child may not, for example, walk till certain age and then right. be passing that age, and then after that, people, uh, the mother may say, think that, oh. My child is okay. Let him stay more, do something more. But the more they delay, for example, like seeking advice, uh, it will be really uh, hard, especially for newcomers. Sure. I know if, for example, like a child born here and then they go just for follow up routinely, so they will catch up with their uh, pediatrician. Right. But for new, for example, comers, person just, just coming from refugee camps, for example, to catch up, it's not like uh, uh, easy uh, sometimes. That's a good point. So you think that would be helpful information to have just even a, a, a small section on, on yes. developmental milestones exactly. and when a parent might, might, might be worried. The easy That's ones. a good point. Any other questions or comments about the book? 
So page 10 and pages 10, 11 starts to talk about how to tell if your child has a fever. And I can tell you as a, as a longtime pediatric nurse, it's not unusual to have parents come and say, I know my child is sick, I know they have a fever, they're burning up. And then you find that they don't have a thermometer. They're going by what their child feels like, assuming their child has a fever. And any of you who are parents can probably speak to times when you were sure your child had a fever. Yes, they did feel like they were, quote, burning up. You take their temperature and, and they don't have a fever. And other times that you thought, well, they're acting a little off, but they're not that hot and you take their temperature and their fever is 103. There, there's no correlation. So even teaching parents to accurately take the child's temperature before they call the physician is an important skill. A number of ways to take a child's temperature, and parents often struggle with this as well. You know if you go to the store, you know, to the, to the pharmacy or to um, the grocery store, there are how many different types of thermometers to take a child's temperature? And if you look at all the splashy ads in, in, um, in magazines or if you look at the aisles at the store, you could spend a lot of money on very fancy thermometers that aren't going to give you as much information as you can get from a very simple thermometer like we've placed at, at the table for you. Parents often ask, well, should I get one of, those, one of those ear thermometers or one of those that go on, on the forehead to take it? And we tell parents no because you have to use pretty specific techniques to get an accurate reading on those thermometers. And you, know, you could be getting misinformation. So just using a simple either um, a non-mercury thermometer, which is not easy to read, those of you who have used those, they're not easy to read and they take a long time. Or the elect electronic digital thermometers that we've shared with all of you. Those are quick, easy to read, and if parents can be taught how to use those accurately and then know what those numbers mean, they'll be able to, to share more information with their physician and have more information themselves. So. Um, the digital thermometers we've shared with you all, the ear thermometers, we do use them some in the hospital, but they're not our first choice in most cases. The plastic strips, how many of you have seen those plastic strips used? So I know some schools have used them in the past. They can either be put on the forehead or, or put under their tongue, depending on what type of plastic strip they are. They're not great. And they're, they're disposable. One time use, you have to throw them away. So they're, they're wasteful and they can get expensive. The, in, as you know, in Maine, um, I don't know if it's in all states, but we, we don't have mercury in the state of Maine anymore. Um, if you find parents who happen to have thermometers, old thermometers that they got handed down to them that have mercury in them, they, they need to be disposed of properly. We're not supposed to have those anymore. Um, they're great to use, they're, they're, uh, they're inexpensive, but if you're going to take a child's temperature, especially a child who doesn't feel very good, and you're trying to keep it under their tongue or under their armpit for five or 10 minutes, how easy is that? Not, no. So really those digital thermometers are the, are the easiest um, and most efficient way to take their temperature. Orally is accurate, most accurate, but you have to put it in the right place under their tongue and it has to stay under there for a while. If you've got the, the old fashioned thermometer, the digital thermometer may give you an answer in a minute or a minute and a half. The ear, as I said, um, we don't recommend it with families at home. Those are very expensive and um, if you don't insert it in the ear canal just right, um, it, it, it isn't accurate, and kids don't usually like things stuck in their ears either. Rectal, 
We know that rectal, thermometer, uh, rectal temperatures in infants are the most accurate. Parents don't usually like to take rectal temperatures on their, on their children. They feel a little squeamish about that, but we do know in, in infants and you know, small babies that is the most accurate. Under the armpit is probably the easiest to do with children. Um, if you do it properly, it can be fairly accurate. It's better than calling a physician and saying, my child's burning up, I don't know what their temperature is, but I'm sure they have a fever. So we do teach families how to take temperatures under the child's armpit. We use that method in the hospital. And then as I said, the forehead thermometers are not accurate and when we don't recommend those. However, I will say if that's the method that the parent is using, it is better than not taking a temperature at all. Okay. And I'm stuck again, Dave. <laughs> I'm so glad I have him here. So does everybody have at least one thermometer at their table? Did everybody get a thermometer? Okay, so go ahead and take your thermometers out of your boxes. The thermometers that we've given you tonight are Fahrenheit thermometers and, and one thing that we noticed in, in prior trainings is that Many people are more comfortable with the Celsius thermometers, the centigrade thermometers. Um, parents who are used to centigrade, they look at the Fahrenheit and they don't know what those numbers mean. So when you're working with your families in the community, find out what they're accustomed to in terms of measurement. And if they're more accustomed to the centigrade thermometers, make sure that they have that type. They may not know what the conversion is between the Fahrenheit and the centigrade. So whatever language the, the families use, get the thermometers that they're more comfortable with. So when you're working with the families in terms of taking temperatures, if they're going to use it orally, they need to make sure that those thermometers are tucked way in the back, under the tongue, Go ahead and try it on yourselves. This is practice time. Are you finding the little covers that go, okay. And you don't want to put it in your mouth after you've put it under your armpit? I don't understand. <laughs> So see how long it takes for you to take your temperature. Did yours beep already? Oh, you're normal. How about that? And you got 97.2. So if you're getting numbers that are lower than like say 97.5-ish, you may not have put it far enough under your tongue. We so she asked about the conversion. We tell parents that 98.6 is roughly 37. 101 is roughly 38.5. And I believe 30, is it 40 is about 104? Does that sound about right, Donna? 40 centigrade is about 104. So that gives you a rough ballpark on what the conversion is. Okay. So, um, yeah, Jen brought up a good point. When you're teaching those parents how to take temperatures, Make sure their child hasn't had something very cold or something very warm to eat or drink before you've taken their temperature if you're doing it um, in their mouth, okay? Everybody feel comfortable with the thermometer thing? Okay. 
Under the armpit, often the easiest way to take a temperature in a small child. It's got to go under the clothes. You can't take the temperature outside the clothes, so it's got to go next to their skin, way up under their armpit, and you got to hold their arm down until it beeps. It may take a little bit longer than, um, than the oral temperature. But if your child's not feeling well, or their child's not feeling well, you can put that thermometer under there and hug them. Time to hug and cuddle the, the child while it's, while it's cooking, okay? Very, very rough rule of thumb, the, the um, axillary temperature is around a degree less than what the oral temperature would be. It's not always an exact conversion, but it gives families a rough idea. Of, of what that might be. So we tell families if, if the temperature is up around 99.9 .9 to 100-ish, if you've taken the, th the temperature under their armpit, then that child has a fever, okay? And the, the handout that I gave you on the exclusion criteria tells what we consider a fever depending on where you take the child's temperature, and that might help, okay? Does everybody feel comfortable with how to teach the families how to take the temperature and decide if the child has a fever and, and when to, to call the physician? So who can find first in the book what you would do if the child had a fever? Did anybody find it? What page? How about that? That's probably what makes sense, right? That, that the section on what to do if the child has a fever comes right after how to tell if the child has a fever. So page 14, 15. So what do you see on those pages? What is it telling you? What are some things the parent can do if their child has a fever? Fluids. Fluids. So we don't starve a fever, right? Give the child fluids. What else are you seeing? Yes? Grace. Lightly. Oh, dress lightly, yes. Yeah, don't bundle them all up. We find parents do that a lot. If they have a sick child and the child has a fever, they've got them in six layers because they think that they should bundle their child. So dress lightly. What else are you seeing? Keep your child's room cold. Yeah, keep the temperature down in the room. So these are all some practical things that parents can do for their children at home if their child has a fever. They don't always have to go right to, to the physician. When do, when do you call a doctor or a nurse if the child has a fever? Yes, if the fever is above 101 degrees. What else does it say? Fever lasts for more than a day uh, in a child less than two years. So a fever lasting more than a day in a child less than two years old. The smaller and younger the child, the more concerned we get about fevers. If they're having seizures, yes, definitely. If they're having a fever with seizures or convulsions. 
So does this all sound pretty doable, pretty practical? So when you're working with those families, advising them that you don't just automatically go to the doctor to the emergency room. You can go to that book, go very stepwise through the book to help get your child through that fever and, and, and uh, make your decisions. Okay, how about what to do if the child has cold or, 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 uh, or flu? Where are you going to find that in the book? What page? So you found it on page 75. Did everybody find it? Okay. And are you seeing the same sorts of advice or the same layout of the advice? So you found the page. What do you see? What is it telling you? So it tells you the symptoms. What else? Encourages the flu shot. Encourages the flu shot. So it does talk about vaccines in there for prevention. What are some things that families can do at home? So rest in fluids. Not putting a pillow, uh, yeah, some families, if they've got a baby with a cold, they might want to prop their babies up with a pillow, so advising them to not do that. Okay. When does it tell you to call a doctor or a nurse? What's that? Less than two months. If they're less than two months old, yeah, those real little babies we get worried about with symptoms more so than the bigger kids. So neck pain. What else did you see? When when? So breathing difficulties. Yeah, if they're having a hard time breathing, especially those little ones. Babies under six months of age have to breathe through their noses, so if they've got stuffy noses, they're going to have a, a much tougher time. Again, don't just assume that the, the child needs to go to the emergency department or to the doctors because they've got these symptoms. Now let's move into over-the-counter medications. That's always a big question for parents. My child has a cold, my child has a fever. Can I just give them some medicine? And you know, with all the advertising we have on TV, somebody's always promoting some kind of medication to make you feel better, and parents see that. So what page? In the book, does it speak about over-the-counter medications? Twenty-one. Thank you. Yes, page twenty-one. Very important to always use the dispenser that comes with the medication. And very often we find families just using common kitchen spoons. So at your table, did we have the little syringes? Yep, you should have medicine cups and syringes and common spoons. So what I'd like you to do at each of your tables is first to draw up the five mLs in the little um, syringe. You've got some blue water at your table. 
So draw that up and empty it into one of the medicine cups. And then after you've done it with the syringe, I'd like you to take one of the spoons at the table, which is allegedly a teaspoon, which should be five mLs. Take a spoonful of that water and put it in another medicine cup. And take a look and see if there's a difference. Not the same, is it? In your case, if they used that spoon for medication, what would happen to that child? You, they would get too much medication. Are you all noticing some differences between the syringe and the spoon? Are you seeing a difference? So does everybody see what would happen if you used a common kitchen spoon as opposed to either a medicine cup or a medicine syringe to give the medication? What might happen? Absolutely. You might give more, which, what would happen? You could overdose the child on medication. And on the flip side, if you don't give enough, what happens? Absolutely. You're not treating the symptoms adequately. So, and I think this is an important lesson to show the parents so that they can really see. It's like, well, we don't see what the difference is if it says it's a teaspoon and the bottle says I give a teaspoon, what's the difference? So to show them that there is a difference and that they could be giving their children too much medicine or they're not treating their, their children's symptoms well enough. So um, do you see the value in, in maybe doing that with some of the families? Reading labels on boxes is important for families as well. And as, as many of you probably know, the, the over-the-counter cold preparations often have Tylenol in them already. And so we have families who are giving their children Tylenol or acetaminophen or ibuprofen for their fever, and then they're giving over-the-counter cold preparations that may already have acetaminophen or ibuprofen in them and overdosing their children. And they don't mean to. Nobody means to hurt their children. But to teach the families to read those labels very carefully. We don't advise giving over-the-counter medications to children for common illnesses anyway. Because it really, you know, Fluids and rest are, are really what's going to get their children better faster. Thankfully now the, the uh, Tylenol for children has been standardized. We used to have two different um, concentrations, one for infants and one for children. That's been standardized, so that does at least help, help parents where that's concerned. And we tell families never, never, never give their children aspirin unless they've been told to for a specific condition by their doctor and nurse. But don't make the decision on their own to give their child aspirin. So what are some things that parents can do 
to help keep the children healthy, keep them from getting ill in the first place. Um, several of you mentioned immunizations. So sharing um, evidence-based information with families about the vaccinations. Good food storage, washing their hands, making sure food is stored at the right temperatures, cooked to the right temperatures. Leftovers are stored properly. How to cover coughs and sneezes. That's a very simple thing that we can teach families and we can teach the kids. We do it when we go to, to, to Head Start with those kiddos, is you know, sneezing into their sleeves. Keeping smokers away from their children. Keeping their children away from, from smokers. Not sharing food and drinks with others. Washing, 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 washing the hands. And just soap and water. Um, I, I know a lot of families will carry the, the hand sanitizer with them. Um, hand sanitizer is not encouraged in preschool settings, in daycare and preschool settings. Um, it's, it's there, put out of reach if that's the only thing they have available, but it's, it's soap and water in that setting. So good hand hygiene. And then talking to families about what the most common um, injuries are that their children might encounter. So falls, we know kids fall all the time. Burns, this time of year, especially, but being careful with those hot liquids on the stove. We see a lot of kids in the hospital who have reached up and grabbed, you know, mummy's or daddy's tea or coffee or a pan off from the stove and pulled it onto themselves. So making sure that's out of reach of the children. Keeping all medicines out of reach of children so they're not getting into them. Choking is another big one with kiddos. Making sure that um, you know, the, the small toys are out of reach. Making sure if, you're, if those toddlers are starting to experiment with, with new foods, making sure things are, are cut up properly. Water safety. This time of year, unless you're in a pool, we're not too worried about pools, or water safety, I should say. And then car accidents. And accidents are the leading cause of, of injury and death in children under nine months of age. So really being very conscious of, of all of those, those safety issues. That's why it's important to have those books personalized for the family. So if they do have those accidents at any point, they, they've got those phone numbers. You all know when you get panicked, it's, it's, it's hard to find the information. It's easy to forget. So if they've got it in their book, they can quickly look it up if need be. Poison control, very important to have handy. The local hospital number and their doctor or their clinic's number. So other things that families can do if they, they want to take an extra step to keep their family safe is learning CPR. And today I was just down at the, the Biddeford campus teaching um, hands-only CPR, not even having to do the mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. We'll be doing that here on the uh, Portland campus on Thursday. But teaching families just how to recognize if their child needs CPR and just, just doing the chest compressions. Having smoke detectors and extinguishers in their house is important. And we know this time of year, lots of fires. Having a, a very simple first aid kit. They don't even have to invest a lot of money. You can make your own very simple first aid kit at home. But having some, you know, bandages, um, gloves if you need to, um, something to clean the wounds, but having a very simple first aid kit at home. 
and you made it through the training. And any questions at all before we have a little bit of time for discussion here? Yes. Why is aspirin not recommended? Um, in viral illnesses in children, they noticed a link between a neurological condition called Rye syndrome when they gave children with viral illnesses aspirin. And that can be pretty devastating for children. It can cause permanent um, disability and in some cases even death. So there are certain conditions that aspirin is warranted, but that's under a, a doctor's um, recommendation. So, and that's been, Jen, would you say at least 25 or 30 years or more? Yeah, it's been a long time. So after participating in this training, how comfortable do you all feel going out and working with families to do this training with them? with the books? More comfortable than when I walked in. You feel more comfortable than when you walked in. Good. Anybody else? Do you have any concerns or what might be some of your concerns about going out and working with the families? Yes. Absolutely. So she said families being, am I saying this right, families being uncomfortable asking questions, assuming that the doctors or the nurses or other health care providers are always right and if they have questions. So perhaps working with the families and using the book will help them feel a little more empowered to be able to ask those questions, to be able to say either I don't agree or I don't understand and can you explain this to me? a little more. Sure. Yes. Some technical or from professional terms, like here on this page, or on 15, mm -hmm. it's a key why. Oh, KY that, jelly. So, so having some technical terms in there that they still may not understand. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying, that, 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 that there's that still the some meaning. language in there that the parents might not understand? Exactly. Sure, and does anybody have some suggestions on what you might do if a parent finds something in the book that they still don't understand? Sorry, I got some feedback here. So French people only mean when they see this one, like men, you know, M-E. So if this one is K for you, I mean Kentucky. It could mean Kentucky, not, yeah, what does that mean anyway? So if, if families do have questions about some of the technical terms in there, what are some things that you might do to help facilitate the understanding? Show them the pictures. Show them the pictures, sure. Explain them. You maybe have parents circle things in the book that they still don't understand and need a little bit of, of explanation. Yeah, also ask them questions to better understand. If they do some things or they need more explanation, you have to ask them questions. So you ask them questions? Yeah. Sure. So, so explaining what some alternatives are to some of those terms that are, that are in there, either that they wouldn't use or, yeah. Yes.
that's no there will um, that's a good so she asked about is there some sort of agenda that the that the the community health outreach workers can take into the families to make sure that you stay on track there will be a book available for each family it's my understanding that each family will get their own book to help facilitate that but you've got a good point is you know is there some methodical way to keep them on track and to make it nice and concise I think that's a great point and I can certainly facilitate that the other thing too is I, I, I think it's important to answer the question that the parents have so you may have an agenda say I think that I need to go about it this way with the families and they may have a completely different idea of what they want to know and how they want to know it and if you're not addressing their needs up front they may not be hearing you does that does that make sense but I think that's a good point and and that gives me something to do thank you Right. The picture Absolutely. So did you hear what she said about the families not being able to read the language that's in the book? So they're not starting from that point. They have their own questions and you will need to steer them to where to find that information within the book and it may be using the pictures and you may have to supplement with those with those pictures as well and when we've done the training with one of the Head Start sites locally um, the parents identified and the and the translators identified that often the children who can speak and read English may be helping their parents to find that information in the book so making sure that this is not, and we talk about mothers. We frequently talk about mothers, but we have mothers, fathers, and grandparents who've come to the trainings. So getting the whole family involved in the training is very important, especially if you have some grandparents who say, well, that's not the way that we do things. So getting the whole family involved, I think, is important. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. The comment I was uh, going to say because most of the families they don't read English right. and maybe that's a project to think about later to have uh, for each topic like pictures just pictures and the child or who will come and do the workshop they have the five se there was five or four five sections the five sections yeah you have most in your head and yeah. when you do the workshop it's very easy you show the pictures and you go with the yeah, the topic. So if maybe later they, we can have uh, pictures for every topic. Do you, That's a, I do, I, you don't understand what I do understand what you're saying, yes. Yeah. So having a picture for every single topic yeah, to show the families yeah. and to, to work with them on that. Um, you all know the families that you work with much better, so knowing what would make sense for each particular family, I think that would be very helpful. So I know that book is, has been translated into some languages, but not all the languages that we have in this community. So it's a, it's a work in progress, for sure. So do you all feel comfortable with your, your role, or do you see what your role is in helping to facilitate this with the families? Any other comments, questions? You want to spend a little time at your tables kind of collaborating and, and sharing ideas that you might have? I'm all done talking. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.